started with a record. Um, so you will now see um, that we're recording now. And so thank you again so much for coming. I am um, really happy this um, this month to welcome our, our guest speaker, um, Emily Robinson. So Emily Robinson is gonna be, uh, I think the reason why a lot of you are here is Emily Robinson is gonna be speaking about um, uh, an introduction to machine learning with, um, in on AWS for, for us users, for us users of R. And so Emily is um, a senior data scientist at Warby Parker. She works on a centralized team there, um, working on a lot of big pro projects. Um, she's worked at other places like Data Camp and Etsy, and um, she's also the author of um, Build a Career in Data Science, a really fantastic book about um, um, some of the non-technical sides of how we build careers in data science. And I'll, I'll drop the link to that um, book. Uh, there because I I recommend that all the time actually um, I'll drop that link there um, and so Emily we are so um, happy that you're able to join us and so thankful for you being able to um, present to us today um, so um, Emily's gonna sit, get set up with sharing her screen here and you are um, uh, welcome to <clears throat> Um, you know, type questions as you go along, as we go along during this talk, I'll keep an eye out for, um, for questions that are relevant, like either me and Andrew and Mark will keep an eye out for questions that are relevant, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. So if anything is like super relevant to what we're talking about right then, we might draw Emily's attention to it. And if not, we will, um, we will uh, uh, use them at the end. So I encourage you, I think you all should have joined muted. So uh, please do stay muted, um, especially like me, if you have noise going on where you are, I'm about to mute myself and um, please stay muted. And uh, you can type questions in the chat um, as we go along if they come to you. And also at the end, you can always use that raise hand feature if you would like to be unmuted to, um, if your question is a little bit longer. Um, all right, so um, Emily, are you able to share your screen? Yes. Awesome. And share that. Okay, can everyone see the title slide? Yes, that looks great. All right, wonderful. Great, well, I'm so excited to be here today. I really enjoyed in the chat getting to see where everyone's dialing in from. Uh, you know, really fun to see people dialing from Europe, Malaysia, India, and of course, some local Salt Lake people. Uh, I just moved to Salt Lake a few months ago, so for those of you who are here, uh, if you want to get coffee or tea, I, I would love to get uh, more connected to the R community here. With that, as Julia said, I'll be talking about an intro to machine learning with AWS um, using R. Uh, you can find these slides at bit.ly slash AWS dogs, uh, and then also I'll drop a link to the, all the code that I'm going to show today. Uh, some of the code I don't show, that's just kind of set up code for the project. You can find that on my GitHub Robinson ES. All right, so I do want to give a little bit about, you know, before we go into this, it's a really big topic. So what specifically will this talk cover? And this talk is going to start with the why and what of the cloud and AWS. And so some of you might be a little familiar with these terms, but in case you aren't, I want to give a brief introduction to them. Then we'll go into how you can connect to AWS from R, from your local RR studio. Helpful AWS terms and packages that we'll be using uh, today to do things like upload images to Amazon storage system, which is S3, uh, because we'll be doing a training and image classification models. Of course, we need some images to train that on. And then evaluating that model's performance. And at the end, I'll wrap up with how to learn more because this is really just getting the tip of the iceberg. So there is a fair amount this talk won't cover, and that includes uh, doing machine learning and any other cloud technology, the math and theory behind the ML, um, behind the model, any other algorithms, and really how to make a good model. And why I say this is I'm gonna show you how to make a model, but I really don't have the time today to show you how can you improve performance through things such hyperparameter tuning, and also, as you'll see, kind of because of the toy project that I picked to demonstrate this with, really would be impossible in this case to make a good model. A little bit of that background I mentioned. First, what is the cloud? Uh, as Julia mentioned, I wrote a book called Build a Career in Data Science, and I like my co-author Jacqueline's definition of you can think of the cloud as expensive sky laptops. 
And she calls it that because it can seem very intimidating and very different from what you do day to day on your laptop. But really, essentially, the cloud are all these computers, you know, similar to yours, just without that monitor, uh, living on a server rack somewhere. And the AWS is one specific cloud technology. And I just pulled this up from the AWS products page. So each of these have, you know, the containers, for example, uh, that's one product, but there are lots of mini products within that. So it's, we're gonna be talking today about doing machine learning and specifically with the SageMaker tool, but really AWS has a lot of different use cases and hundreds or thousands of technologies within it. AWS SageMaker in particular is, as I mentioned, one for doing machine learning. And you can use it, uh, everything from you, the start where you wanna prepare your data uh, to building, to writing that code for your model, to training and tuning and proving that model. And finally, to deploying and managing it. If, for example, you want uh, any person in the world to be able to use your model by say, sending it a picture of a dog or a cat uh, and getting back what the model classifies it as. Well, why should we think about using the cloud instead of just our local machine for doing machine learning as some of you may be used to? Well, as Brandon says here, one big benefit is putting it on your resume. So you can build a deep Bayesian transformer running on multi-cloud Kubernetes uh, versus a SQL query built on a stack of egregiously oversimplifying assumptions. And it is true, Brandon's joke here is that often you may not need the fanciest thing uh, to go into production, but the fancy thing does look good on your resume. But in all seriousness, the cloud gets you access or can get you access to a supercomputer. So for example, you are probably unable on your local laptop to train a 128 layer neural network on millions of images. And this might sound a little bit like overkill, uh, but certainly if you're working at certain companies, uh, this may be something you need to do. And that's simply not feasible unless you wanna buy your own GPU for thousands of dollars. Or uh, in the case of my brother, Dave, win one on Slice, uh, which is a machine learning competition. So that I think is one of the biggest benefits. The other one is you can start with their model blueprint. So what I'll show today is basically getting started with AWS has a sort of base image classification model. And one of the nice things it comes with was when you train these models, you know, you spin up a computer to train it, it needs to have certain packages installed, et cetera. And they have a Docker container, uh, which is ready to go with everything you need to do an image classification. And finally, as I showed with the diagram, you can have a full pipeline. So it can do every AWS or any cloud technology can do any, everything from storing your data to training your model, creating an endpoint for that real-time inference. If you want people to be able to call it, get back the answer for say what it thinks your image is. And if you do deploy it into production, so you make it customer facing, monitor how it's doing. Now, why AWS in specific, specifically? Well, the real answer is, that's because what my company Warby Parker uses. But in all seriousness, do if you're working at a company and you wanna use this uh, for that company, I would see if they already use a cloud technology. Even if it's they're not using it for ML, it'll just be easier to adapt that one because the engineers will always already be familiar, familiar with it. You probably have billing set up. You probably have some representatives from that company who would be more than happy to get you started uh, with that, uh, with using ML, with that technology, since it means more money. Uh, but if you don't have that, really there's lots of options. There's Google Cloud, there's Azure from Microsoft, IBM Cloud, Saturn Cloud. Uh, and the great thing is if you're using it for a personal project, a lot of them have free tier or free credits. So the biggest worry when I had getting started, even though it would be billed to my company, is that I'd rack up a huge bill. And if you're using it for professional, uh, for personal reasons, you may think, you know, I don't have like, you know, hundreds of dollars to spend on just to learn this technology. But the good thing is with this uh, free credits, those can be like you have $100 or $200 of credits to spend, uh, or a free tier means you get sometimes unlimited usage or a lot of hours, uh, you know, on their machines that, that aren't uh, you know, as powerful, as expensive, but can get you trying out the technology. So definitely check those out and uh, you should be able to do projects either for free or just maybe for a dollar or two dollars. So on a little that pricing, one thing I didn't realize before learning about this is that these for AWS, you are billed by the hour uh, with the price determined by the machine you're using. So I've been worried, oh my gosh, if I run a really, you know, a memory intensive job, am I gonna rack up a big bill? And that's not the case. Uh, it's just a flat rate per hour, and you can see what that rate is on their SageMaker pricing page. 
And it can be as cheap as five cents an hour up to $28 an hour. Uh, and it's very transparent. It's like, if you want to run, um, you know, a training job on a machine with this many cores, uh, with this much memory, for example, this is how much it's going to cost you. Some things uh, like training jobs, your training a model, automatically stop when, when they're done. Uh, so you spin it up, you launch your training job, your model trains, and then once it finishes training, it will spin back down. Other things like Jupyter Notebooks, uh, which you can run through AWS, uh, those are continuously running until you shut them down. Uh, and really the only disadvantage of shutting them down is it takes a few minutes to restart it. Uh, and anything you have just in memory is lost. So you can think of it as similar to restarting your computer. So any files you've saved, those will exist even if you shut it down and restart it. Uh, but if you have, say, a, a data set of memory that was very computationally expensive to create, you'll probably want to save that as an object. So if you do shut it down, you can just read that back into memory when needed. One thing I learned on uh, doing this, preparing for this talk, is for a personal uh, account, you actually need to submit a support ticket to use the more expensive machines. And in the image classification model case, uh, any of the machines that are able to run that model uh, are in that tier where you have to submit a support ticket. Fortunately, it's, it's pretty easy to do so. Um, and they get back, they got back to me within like 20 hours uh, or so. Uh, but this is one way they put to help prevent you from accidentally uh, starting something, you know, with one of those machines that costs, I think in my case, it was even just a couple bucks an hour. Um, and certainly the more expensive ones that are $10, $20 an hour. And finally, you can always view what your bill is on the billing console and you can set yourself budget alerts so you'll get alerted if you go over it. Um, but as I said, sort of at the start, the fortunate is fairly transparent and it will say which which machine you're using, how much it will cost, and you can keep an eye on that. See, for example, how long a training job is running, set it to stop if it takes too long, and so on. I uh, hear someone who uh, is not muted. If everyone could just make sure to mute, thank you. Uh, so how I got started in AWS was basically this gif of diving straight into the deep end. Uh, why I say that is my company uh, had a use case we thought, OK, we could use and it's classification for something, but none of us had ever really uh, done that at that scale. We hadn't used AWS SageMaker. Uh, basically, I was tapped on the shoulder and say, hey, are you interested in learning this? And this was pretty cool because there are a lot of things I didn't know before doing uh, this project for work, which started about January uh, this year. And those included little things such as image classification, what the cloud was. I mean, I'd heard of it, but like, what was it really? Deep learning, again, heard of it, saw some talks around it, never done it. The AWS SageMaker SDK. What SageMaker was? What an SDK was? And of course, whether I'd accidentally rack up that huge bill and get fired. And I preface this because, uh, you know, this, at least to me, I come from a more statistics, uh, analytics, data science background, social science. Uh, I don't have a degree in computer science. Uh, you know, I haven't worked as an engineer. Um, and so to me, this is the first seemed a little bit intimidating, right? There's like a lot there and this felt like, oh, that's like what a machine learning engineer does. That isn't necessarily what like a, a data scientist kind of the more analytics decision science bent does. But I, that's why I wanted to make this talk because I was able to learn a lot through this process. And I wanted to show that and also demystify it a bit for other people and really help show you that, you know, you are capable of learning and using this technology uh, you know, you won't, <laughs> it's very hard to bankrupt yourself. Uh, and there's a lot there, but uh, little can go a long way. So with that, I wanna, you know, bring us to the problem that I'll be talking about today, which is, I really think one of the hardest, uh, but also most important ML problems of our time. And that is, is a dog an 11 or 12? Or 13 or 14? Uh, Mm -hmm. And this is a really important question. I think we've heard uh, uh, because, you know, can we tell from this image what a dog should be rated? And if you're confused by these ratings, if this is new for you, this is courtesy of the great Twitter account, We Rate Dogs at Dog Rates, which I highly recommend you follow if you're not. And so this, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, the account was fairly popular before, but it really took off when this exchange took place, where this guy was confused, as you may be, saying, well, you give all these dogs, you know, 11 or 12s, or in the case, 13, 14s, even 15 out of 10, 
like that rating system doesn't make sense. And Ray Dog said, of course, the great line, they're good dogs, Brent. Um, the owner of this account, uh, the one who runs it is so successful. In fact, he has actually dropped out of college because as he puts it, he's effectively monetized a Twitter account where he numerically objectifies dogs. So I wanted to ask the question, could I tell from the dog's image what its rating uh, is? And so to get this data set, I use the great RTweet package uh, as well as good old download files from Regex to get the images and ratings uh, from 3 to 56 at dog rates tweets. 235 of those images were rated 11 or 12 out of 10, whereas 121 were 13, 14, or the very rare 15 out of 10. Uh, and for um, AWS, for their image classification algorithm, all the images have to be the same size. So I rescaled them uh, with the magic package. And then I randomly uh, split the images and into different folders into training, validation, and holdout sets. I'm not going to show this code here today because uh, it doesn't really have anything to do with AWS or, or deep learning or SageMaker, but it is available at that link at the bottom. So my GitHub Robinson ES uh, and the repo is called We Rate Dogs. Spoiler alert, how'd the model end up doing? Well, you know, I expect most people here, uh, you know, sort of the target is talk is people who hadn't necessarily done deep learning before. But if you had heard about, it, you might be saying, gosh, that's not a whole lot of images. Like I really thought one of the things about deep learning was like you needed a lot of images in order to like get like, you know, any kind of good, good model out. And to that I say, this is undoubtedly the worst image classification that's ever run. Well, it did run. And that is really the point of this talk. Again, going back to that, what will this talk not cover? It will not necessarily teach you how to make a good model, but I wanted to teach you how to make a model. Uh, and I thought this was a fun use case and it did run and, and all the code you know, set up that training connecting to AWS uh, from our studio, et cetera. All of that would be the same, uh, you know, regardless if you have a, a, you know, a use case where you do, in fact, a better use case for image classification where you do have, you know, hundreds of thousands of images to train it on. Let's go into the setup code now. I want to give a disclaimer before I start this section of the talk, which is there will be a lot of code. And that code will be, or really should be, again, if you're you know, the attendant audience for this talk, totally new to you. So please don't try to memorize the code. Focus on the steps we need to do, and you could come back to the exact code later, again, on that GitHub, and these slides are also available online. I want to emphasize that because I'm not going to talk about every single argument in the function or all the nuances, because I really just want to have you focus on sort of the big picture. What are the steps we need to do? Get some familiarity with what it looks like. And again, you can revisit that code at a later time. Your first step is creating an AWS account. I just copied here from AWS instructions how to do this. Hopefully, this should be fairly straightforward uh, for you to create a personal account. Uh, again, if you're not doing this on behalf of the company. The next step is you need to create your keys. And your keys are essentially how you authenticate, how you, uh, when you say in our studio, you give a command to uh, spin up a training job on AWS, how it knows what AWS account to do it, and how it knows you have permission to tell, in my case, Emily Robinson, AWS account, that yes, uh, this person asking to spin up a training job, they are authenticated, they're allowed to do this. So once you're logged on to AWS, you go to your name, my security credentials, and then you'll, uh, can, you can get here and create an access key. When you click that blue button, you'll get both a new access key and a secret access key. That secret access key is, as you can see, it, see it says they're in orange. Uh, if you lose or forget it, you can't retrieve it. You'll just need to make a new one. Uh, so make sure when it pops up that you copy that down right away. Once you have those, you'll need to save them in your R environment. You can use the really handy uh, edit R environment oh, uh, function so from you use this. Oh, and so you can add the that AWS problem. access key, secret access key, and the region in this case, to your R environment. So of course, my keys are not actually ABC, DFG. You'll need to replace that with what yours are. Next, we'll need to install and import the Python packages we'll be using. So we use the R library Reticulate, um, which is a great package for uh, going back and forth between R and Python using Python from our studio. We'll use its functions pi underscore install to install the SageMaker package pandas, good old pandas. Uh, and then similar to how we do a library call, 
Uh, with Python packages, we do import instead of library. Um, we're going to import the Bato3 uh, package. Now, you may notice I didn't install the Bato3 package. That's because it comes along as a dependency with SageMaker. Bato3 is going to be the package as like a general purpose Python package for interfacing with a bunch of different AWS services. And the SageMaker package is specifically for uh, the machine learning operations we're going to do. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, wait, Python, this was a use our talk. Why are we talking about Python here? And sort of the unfortunate, well, not, you know, I don't want to get into language work here, but Python is the better language for using AWS services. And that's because there is no officially supported R package by AWS. Whereas with Python, uh, that SageMaker and Bado3 packages, those are uh, officially, those are made by AWS, they're supported by them, they're documented, they're updated, et cetera. Um, and so they're, they're really uh, quite reliable. Uh, there is the pause package, uh, which is a pretty good general package for accessing AWS services from R, but it doesn't have the SageMaker function. So I decided uh, it was just a little bit easier to stick with the official packages. And so we'll use Reticulate um, to use uh, to call Python functions from our studio. However, if you are someone who is comfortable with Python, maybe you use both languages or use it before and you can pick it back up. Um, it might make sense just to write uh, you know, sort of vanilla Python code uh, in the editor of your choice or Jupyter Notebook or VS Code. Our first step, now that we have our packages installed, our environment set up, is to create an S3 client. What we do here is, as I mentioned, Bado3 is sort of a general purpose. It works with a lot of AWS services. And S3, the storage system, is one of those services. So our first step is to create this S3 object where we say the first argument you can see in this function is S3. It is saying, okay, we want to basically get access to the functions that have to do with S3. The dollar sign syntax here, you can think of a little bit like uh, the colon colon. So in order to call functions from Python uh, packages that we imported, we do it with the dollar sign. Uh, so in this case, Bado3 is a package, dollar sign client is the function. Once we have created that S3 object, we then call from it the function create bucket. A bucket is essentially, think of as a folder on the S3 storage system. So just like you, you know, have probably have multiple folders on your computer for different R projects you're working on. Uh, if say you're working on multiple image classification problems, you probably wanna make an individual bucket for each of them. So in my case, I make a bucket called we rate dogs. Our next step is to upload all of our images of the very cute dogs uh, to S3 to store them. So I use the handy um, dir underscore ls function from the fs package to first get a list of all of those images that I have. So I, I basically just concatenate all the images from the holdout, train the validation set. I use per's nice walk function. So for every image um, in, that, in that vector, uh, I use the function upload file to upload the file, uh, the file name to the bucket we rate dogs. And the key argument here is what we want that called in S3. So in this case, I say, I don't really need that resize images part that, you know, is that, this, that prepends all of the images. So take that out. Uh, and so it will be called uh, in S3, as we can see, if we view it through the console, you know, uh, andy.jpg, batman.jpg, bo.jpg, those are the dog names. Uh, if we look up at the URL, we can see uh, it is in the we rate dogs buckets. And we see at the end of the URL that prefix, uh, it's holdout slash image directory slash. Uh, and that's because even though they're not technically folders on the interface of AWS, it essentially looks like folders. So in the we rate dog buckets, we have three quote folders, holdout, validation, and train, as we saw here. Um, and then each of those has a subdirectory, image directory. And then we have all of our very cute dog photos. Now that we have our images up there, we need to create uh, specifically for their image classification algorithm, uh, a table with three columns for the training and the validation set. And that table is to tell the algorithm, okay, uh, this file, this image, what is its classification? So in this case, I call that, the classification model is called dichotomized rating uh, because I decided that 11 or 12, that would be a zero. Uh, 13, 14, or 15, that would be a one. And the first column here, that index, is just, you just have to make a unique identifier uh, for each image. So 
So again, if you're interested in the code to create this table that I have, that's in the GitHub repo. But once I have it created, I need to write that table. Um, this was a little finicky, so I, I sort of included this as specific SV tab separated. You have to have code equals false, otherwise it won't, won't work. But I have these two tables, uh, for the, one for validation, one for train. And then I use that upload file function again to upload it to the we rate dog buckets. Uh, again, file name is specifying what's it called on my computer. And the key is what do I want it called on S3? All right, so now we've done the setup where we have our images on S3, so AWS can find them. We have our, our, our tables that are required to tell it, okay, what class is each image? So now we can start writing our SageMaker code. So our specific code for making the model and, and getting it ready to train. Well, first I do wanna share this because this is something that was very confusing to me when I got started, which is that uh, SageMaker, that package is both a high and a low level API. So this, these two uh, you know, pieces of code on the left and the right, they essentially do the same thing, but as you can tell the one on the left is a fair bit more for both. So that's the low level API. And the low level API is, uh, the benefit of it is it is more, more flexible if you wanna like change certain things, um, but also as you can see, it's a lot more verbose, whereas the high level abstracts things away a little bit um, that for most people you won't need to change that. And so in this talk, I'll be doing a high level API, but I wanted to share that. So if you do start looking at this on your own, you won't have my confusion, which is like, wait, I'm looking at two different tutorials and they seem to be doing the same thing, but this seems like the, syn the syntax is somewhat similar, but it was definitely confusing because as you can see, it's not the same. Um, and so this was really helpful when I figured out they have these two levels. I also wanted to share this, this is kind of a general principle of AWS that they have a lot of ways to do the same thing or, or similar things. And Corey Quinn is a great person who uh, tweets, we've consult about AWS. I shared when there was the latest uh, AWS Cloud app runner that there are in fact now 17 ways to deploy containers on AWS. And he later followed up with a blog post uh, talking about those 17 ways. You're like, wow, that's a lot, isn't it? And it is, it is a lot. And it can be quite confusing when you're getting started because you're like, well, what if I just want one way? I just want a way or the way, or what's the best way? I don't want to have to learn about these 17 different ways. And that is a little bit of a disadvantage, but the, the benefit of this is AWS really does prize backwards compatibility. So essentially, if you have something that's been working before, ideally it will still be working in a couple of years. And so because of that, they can't really make any breaking changes. So uh, some of these come about because, you know, there really are different, you know, reasons to deploy your container. And so these, you know, different, different ways they have to do it may really serve different functions, but it's also because if they come up with a new way or a better way to do it, but such a thing that would, you know, break the old way of doing it, they essentially have to make a new service instead of uh, changing the old one and making it so people who are using the old way would have to uh, change what they're doing. So we got that out of the way. Um, our first step in the stage is we need to create an IAM role. And essentially you can think of this as a way to tell, uh, you know, within my user that specifically, you know, this role has permission to do these functions. So in this case, we need to create a role that has permissions to do the SageMaker functions. Now, I'll be honest, this doesn't really uh, seem to make a lot, whole lot of sense and, and or it doesn't help that much uh, in, in a personal uh, use case. You could see how this would be very handy in a business where you have lots of people using AWS and you want certain people to have access to SageMaker, certain people to mobile development, certain people to like S3. Um, and so this is a way to give a permissioning system so everyone doesn't have the same permissions you have permissions based on the role and what you need to do. So in our case, we need to create one that has permissions for SageMaker. And so I've just copied here are the steps uh, from the URL at the bottom to create this. And when I did it, I called it SageMaker underscore role. Once we have that created uh, through, through our web browser, through console, we'll, uh, just as we did with S3, we'll create an IAM client and from that, we'll get the function get role. And so this is getting uh, the ARM, the Amazon resource name of the role we just created. So we'll be able to pass that to our functions and it will know that, hey, you know, this person uh, is trying to set up the training job, not just is it Emily Robinson, it is the specific IAM user who has SageMaker permissions. Now we've done that, we'll create an estimator. And so an estimator is kind of like the blueprint for our model. 
So things we feed in include that role ARN we just had. The training image is the Docker image for Amazon's uh, image classification algorithm. We'll tell it in the instance type, we want this type of computer, so an MLP2 extra large. So that's a computer with specific cost, with specific number of memory, um, and cores, et cetera. Uh, and then there's a few other kind of boilerplate things here. What kind of input are we giving it? We're giving it files of images. Where should I put our output, et cetera. So it's kind of getting us started with like the basics of we're going to be doing image classification algorithm on this type of computer in this way. Now that we've done that, our next step is to create hyperparameters. So hyperparameters here, some of them are dictated by, uh, you know, how many images you have. You see we have like a num training samples uh, or the number of classes. In our case, it's a binary classification or the image shape. Uh, but some of them are things that, you know, certainly differ even when those are the same. So um, epochs and, uh, you know, top K mini batch size. So these are all things that, you know, have to do with deep learning specifically. And so uh, I definitely recommend, you know, if you are new to deep learning, you can sort of learn about this, but this is nothing specific to, you know, AWS in this case, this is a general deep learning thing. You'd have to specify this with any, any algorithm you wanted to do. But an AWS specific thing we have to do is tell, okay, once we, I also got that model ready, okay, where the heck does it, do I find uh, the images and where do I find those tables that tell me, okay, this image is class you know, zero or class one. And this is uh, the way that uh, AWS does it. You create this data channels dictionary with those four keys and its values in this case being those specific, the training input type. And I'm pointing it to, uh, those S3 locations of where my images and the tables are. How oh, that we've done that? That was a little anticlimactic. Really, the last step is just called a fit function using that input. If you remember that IC, it's sort of saved along the way that we've created it. It, it, it knows its hyperparameters. And so once we do this, the training job launches. You can view that training job if you want online uh, at the URL below. Your, your region might differ. And so in this case, we could see my image classification training job. It, uh, I did this on October 9th, it took eight minutes and then it completed. Uh, if you have you know, really an actual good uh, deep learning image classification problem, it probably won't take eight minutes because you'll have many, many, many more images. But with you know, something like uh, 300 images about the holdout set, it was really pretty quick. In the spirit of honesty, I do also want to share that there were many, many failed jobs before this, but part of the reason I did this talk was there are not uh, as many resources out there for, you know, using connecting to AWS from R, uh, you know, using uh, with using reticulate functions, and so hopefully, you know, if you you'll be able to run the code, you know, on GitHub without all of these failures. Uh, but I do want to share this as don't get discouraged. You do get error messages. There are somewhat informative, um, you know, a little bit of trial and error, but, uh, you know, you, you, you will be, I do believe that you will be able to, at the end of the day, uh, making training job that succeeds. And now that it's succeeded, if we click on it, so if we go and we click on that image classification 2021 20, 10, you know, 09 that completed, we can scroll down and we can uh, view the logs. And these logs will tell us how is our accuracy? So an epoch is one run over uh, the data set. And so generally your hope is you get more accurate as, as it runs over the data set more and more times. And our last epoch here was the fifth epoch. It's a zero index, so epoch four. Um, we could see our training accuracy was 0.61 and our validation was 0.69. Uh, okay, so like that's doesn't seem so bad, but you might, you know, it could be like we have two binaries, it could have been 0.5, but actually if you remember, our classes aren't balanced. We have more dogs that are rated low than high. So did it just predict every dog uh, was rated low? You know, low in this case, still of course a good 11 or 12 out of 10. And something I found a little annoying when I started is you actually can't, you, want, you need to do extra steps before you can view the model's predictions either for new images you wanna give it or even the images that it was trained on. So if you say, okay, what did it predict? Uh, for the last validation, you know, for the validation set of images, you have to do an extra step of a batch transform job. And a batch transform job is when you want to feed basically a bunch of images at once and say, hey, run the model on each image and give me its prediction out. So in this case, I run the transformer function. 
uh, which is telling you, okay, the batch transform, it has to spin up a machine. What kind of instance do I want? You know, how powerful machine? And, you know, the transform function, which, what images do I want it to run over? So in this case, I said, let me just see what it would predict for all the validation images. I included this code not to go through to depth, but again, being like, this feels trickier than I feel like it should be, uh, which is code for uh, once you've run that batch transform job, like getting back what it what it uh, you know what it predicts. Um, and this is why I would say beyond the cost, of course, of why you might not want always want to do all your ML stuff on AWS is there can be a, you know a decent amount more overhead. Um, so I wouldn't say now it's like oh no, never run you know you know, stuff on your computer, absolutely not. Um, a lot of times your, your, you know, your local laptop, your our studio or your Python, you know, packages, uh, SK Learn or the new tidy models from our studio, those will do great. Um, but, uh, you know, there are some use cases where, you know, again, you have lots of, you have lots, lots of images, your laptop's not powerful enough, you want to integrate, make it easier to, uh, you know, deploy your model that you may choose to use AWS. But in this case, this is how we fetch our predictions. And, if you remember, I had my spoiler alert for how the model ended up doing. And so it probably does not come as a big surprise that it predicted everything would be rated low. As I said at the top, I had no expectations I'd get anything different. For one, there are very few trading images as uh, very few images to train on. But also, if you think about it, is this one even if we have millions of images? Like, do you really believe there is something that, that you know, there's, there's sort of a systematic interpretation of the, of the pictures? Uh, that the you know dog rates uh, Twitter account owner goes through, and so there's actually a signal there. Probably not. Um, so in our case, you know, even if I had millions of images, we may have found there's just no signal there from the images to predict its rating. In conclusion, you know, I want to wrap up with some resources that I set up the start to help you learn more. So there are a lot of resources out there for getting started with AWS SageMaker. There is the, uh, specifically for Python, the SK, that software developer kit, the docs. There's example notebooks that AWS has on GitHub. Uh, there's a developer guide. Uh, there's also resources not made by AWS. So for example, Udacity has a SageMaker course. Uh, I found some of their de uh, you know, deployment notebooks on, on GitHub. Uh, if you're you know, more interested in the, in the deep learning part than the you know, AWS SageMaker part, or, I mean, really they go together. Uh, I highly recommend uh, the Deep Learning with Python uh, book. It just came out with the second edition. It's by the author of uh, the Keras package. Um, I uh, should read it. I've read some bits of it, but it gets it's very, very, very highly reviewed, um, and it really gets into like the practicality and the theory here, as well as you know, the code. One of the top takeaways from this talk is that it's actually pretty hard. I don't want to say it's impossible because it's not. Uh, but to, it's pretty hard to rack up a huge bill. So, you know, I try not to let that be the barrier. You know, you can do things like set those budget alerts. You also might want to consider, I've seen uh, some people's AWS accounts get hacked. Uh, so you consider, for example, putting uh, multi-factor authentication on your account uh, to make sure like no one else can, you know, run jobs uh, on your behalf. And again, remembering you have to submit these tickets to uh, say, why do you want uh, access to more expensive machines? So, you know, with the free tiers, I, I would, you know, if you're worried about the billing, you know, I think I would, I would not let that dissuade you and, you know, kind of put in some guardrails and then you can even try it out for no money at all with the, with the free tiers and free credits. As I said, if you can use Python, it's probably easier than using Reticulate. There are a few finicky things with uh, the environment um, and actually, especially if you use the SageMaker Jupyter Notebook. So as I mentioned, like one of the services they offer is a Jupyter Notebook. Um, those are included in the, in the free tier, uh, if you're getting started, um, otherwise as it, they can cost a little as five cents. That's not nothing, but it's just a little bit easier because you don't have to mess as much with the environment, because uh, it already sort of, you know, you've sort of authenticated just doing things from there in the first place. And that there's a lot of resources for and ways to do things in AWS. Uh, yeah, this was pretty overwhelming for me when I started because it felt like almost there were too many. There was just random blog posts. There was this AWS doc. There was that one. There was this one with like, you know, lots of subbars. But, you know, I really want to say, you know, this is just something that it's, it's, it's not you, it's them. Um, and, you know, there's a lot to learn out there, but you can get value from doing just one piece, like one step at a time. Um, so if you, you know, it, I definitely found it a little bit intimidating where I started, but I tried to remember, you know, for example, when I was first learning R, right, like how overwhelming that felt, 
Uh, now I feel very comfortable uh, with it. And I still don't know tons of things of how to do it in R, but I have sort of built up the confidence that I can learn how to do it. And um, that's really sort of the only way to do it is just to get started, get your feet wet. And I hope between this talk and uh, the slides and the, the uh, code that I put in the repository, I can make that getting started a little bit easier for you. With that, I wanna thank uh, my co-author Jacqueline Nolis for the slide design, my brother David Robinson for some code advice, my managers and teammates at Warby Parker, uh, who believe me enough to like give me a chance to do this project, to learn a lot, uh, you know, to fail some. Uh, and of course, every all of the good dogs, which is of course every dog. Again, if you wanna find these slides, you can find them at bit.ly slash AWS dogs. I have a blog on hookedondata.org. I've not yet turned these slides or code into a blog post. Uh, if you're interested in that, please let me know. Um, you can find me, but I have a lot of other blog posts uh, around career stuff, around R, um, et cetera. Find me on Twitter at Robinson underscore yes. And finally, as Julie mentioned, uh, I met my colleague with Jacqueline, we wrote a book, Build a Career in Data Science, which you can find at datasidecareer.com. And with that, I really want to thank you all so much, and I'm happy to take some questions. Emily, that was so fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, I I think that was so, it was so great to have that talk at that level, because um, I don't think I have... I have seen anybody talk about how to get started with AWS at that level, which is really, really great. So that's fantastic. Um, so most of the um, most of the um, comments that came in while you were talking were not specific questions, but rather reflections on like what's out there in terms of you know like our packages and whatnot. People who had maybe like tried using the pause package or um, reflecting on like. Uh, different levels of native support in R, say like um, for like Google Cloud Platform versus Azure versus other things. So I don't know if any of that is um, super relevant to like us chatting about here, I, because partly because I think it sounds like um, you you mainly jumped straight into AWS and haven't don't have as much like hands on re um, experience with the other. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And okay. That was just because, as I said, um, yeah. that's what our company already is. So. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. No, that makes total sense. That makes total sense. Okay. So if you, so um, all of you who are here, um, if you've got a question, you can type it into the chat or you can use the raise hand feature, which is there under um, reactions. And I will unmute you. I think I think you're all now set that you can't unmute yourselves. So I think I will have to, I guess I got to turn that off now, but um, you, um, uh, you, I, I can unmute you if you want to, if it's longer and you want to like uh, ask a question. So please do that. You've got questions that are um, going on. If you're, as you're, so, so please do that. As we're kind of getting um, through that, one thing that I, um, that came to mind, as you were giving that talk and I was thinking about it is um, as you did this and you were thinking about um, uh, as you were thinking about um, you know the tooling that exists now what were some of the things that came to mind to you that you were like ah I wish I wish this existed or I wish this such and such tooling existed or I wish um, um, this such and such package existed or like, um, what, what were some of the things that you were like, well, I may, I'm doing it the way it is now. Cause that's the world, the world that exists. But like, what were some of the things that you felt like would have made thing life easier? Yeah. So definitely, I feel like mostly like it can take a little bit. Sometimes it can be a little, little finicky. Um, but mostly I feel like their tools are pretty good. The one that is a bit annoying is that batch transform code that I showed. I feel like that code is bit was pulled from one of their tutorials. So I don't think I'm missing some like, oh, very obvious short way to like, once you run this transform job, get back the prediction. It really is just sort of this annoying, like get the label and do it all for this and do a list comprehension. Um, so I was sort of surprised about that. Uh, the other thing was just some limitations of the built-in uh, uh, algorithm. So for example, it can only, I believe it can only optimize on accuracy uh, when it's like going through the training runs. And of course, if you have unbalanced classes, right, uh, especially really unbalanced classes, you're like, well, that's not, you know, like just like mine did, right? It, it optimized on accuracy, it just predicted everything's the same class. 
Um, so, you know, you can change the upstream data, right? You can do upsampling or downsampling to try to make classes more balanced, but that was sort of annoying versus if you're doing it like on your local computer, you can set it to optimize for different metrics that aren't accuracy that, that better capture that. Um, and I made sure, so we had some AWS uh, like engineering support and I, you know, I wanted to confirm like, hey, I want to confirm like my understanding of this and that's true. So like that was one drawback. Um, and that's an example where like, even though like, make it easy to get started is more limited than if you sort of spin up your own model. Yeah, okay, nice. All right, Simon has a question and he asks, um, so we, I think we all like really resonated when you showed that thing where it's like success and beneath it's like, bail, 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 bail. we're like, oh yeah, we've all been there. And he asks like, um, do you remember like what, what were some of the things that led to some of those failed jobs? Yeah, so one of the embarrassing things was, uh, so that upload file function I showed, I forget what it is, but there's another function that sounds very similar. I think it's upload object. And so that's originally how I uploaded the images, except it wasn't actually successfully uploading the images. So I kept trying to tweak other things. I was like, no, the images must be right. So like, I'm missing that. So like some of those failed code was failing on the same thing. The images were wrong until I figured it was upload file and not upload object. Um, some of the other things, which, uh, you know, I mentioned was like a little finicky. So sometimes I couldn't quite tell, was it just differences in developing it locally versus on a SageMaker notebook versus like, you know, sort of going through our studio to reticulate right to Python. But some of the code uh, that I had, like you might have noticed, I was passing explicitly when I created like the S3, the IAM, like the secret access key, the access key. In theory, you shouldn't need to do that. Um, like it should look in your environment and find those automatically. But after playing around, I found it didn't. Um, so that's why I kind of, again, part of the motivation for doing this was to save you all from that just like finicky pain of um, getting things set up uh, so it will work correctly. Nice. Um, Alex Rose has a question. Um, how much, like, how much time do you feel like you spent learning the sort of um, foundational things about AWS, things like roles, um, what is S3 before you were able to use SageMaker? Did you, did you like learn it all at once? And you were just like, ah, what is all this? But like how much, I guess, how much of the, was stuff about like how AWS worked before you went into learning about SageMaker? Yeah, I'll be honest, I sort of did a like, you know, just in time learning type thing where basically I learned the thing when I'm like, this is now blocking me from being able to do this stuff. So not always, but it's at least half the time the error messages are fairly informative. And so it's like, you don't have the authorization to do that thing. And I'd be like, hmm, like, let me, okay. So let me be like, okay, what is AWS like authorization? Like learn about IAM, you know, and I also had some internal resources with like our security team, people to ask. Um, but yeah, I would say in that, I found that helpful just sort of throw myself in the deep end as I did with that GIF rather than say starting and be like, let me read like a book about all this stuff. Because the unfortunate thing is because AWS is like this vast ecosystem, there's so much there that it's probably actually not going to be that relevant that I found it more helpful just to like, you know, figure out, okay, as I like sort of stumble along, what do I need to learn at this point? Yeah, nice. Um, can ask, um, are there tools in SageMaker for like no code? Um, uh, like modeling and pipelines, um, and did you use any of them? There is. Um, so all that that code that I did, um, you know, like spin up the trading job, you can do that uh, like point and click. Like if you go on the SageMaker console, you can say, you know, you can specify those things. It's going to be file mode, like my images are this shape, et cetera. Um, you know, so the joke I was going to say is like in this household, we are not, we are a, not a no code uh, family. <laughs> So no, in all seriousness, I do think that's a perfectly fine way to get started. It, it, you know, it lowers the barrier, I think, a little bit to entry. I just like showing the code, you know, it's all the reasons some of us, you know, code instead of using BI tools, right? It's just more repeatable. You can run it again, version control, et cetera. Yep. Um, but the other thing you can learn is like when you spin up that training job, like right when I viewed the logs, what was above it was all the information, like it's a file mode, whatever, which would kind of show you, you know, if you're doing point and click, for example, what would that be or the other way around? Yeah. So um, I, pr I apologize if I'm saying you're running any wrong. Defon or Defon, um, uh, who, who I think above said he's actually trying to like improve some of the R tooling around AWS. Um, he said, uh, uh, they ask, um, uh, so you've done it, you've made a project, you have done it in, for work too. Um, so do you feel like, oh, that sucked and discouraged? Or do you like, hey, no, that worked. I'm going to do it more. I'm going to look for opportunities to use like cloud computing because I see the value of it. Like, where does it kind of leave you feeling? 
Yeah. So one thing I, was, I don't think I said was actually for work, I just did everything in Python with the SageMaker Jupyter. So I actually have some background in Python from years ago. So I sort of picked that up. It was kind of painful every time I wanted to pick a plot or do pandas. Um, but like I said, I do think it was a better experience for like, you know, interface with the AWS SageMaker. Um, so I would say, actually, I'm not, I was kind of, there were occasions where I was discouraged when I was preparing this talk. So I was like, why, like, why is it not finding the environment variables? How do I do this thing? But now that I've done it, I mean, I'm sure I'll run into more things if I continue, but I do feel like, okay, I figured out some of the most finicky bits. Uh, so that makes me more encouraged. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, like one thing I haven't dove in either in work or as a side project is just using any of their other algorithms, right? They have like XG Boost, they have a bunch of stuff. And yeah, I certainly do feel like, I think I'll stick to, you know, for example, I love the tidy model stuff for anything where I was like, okay, I feel pretty confident I can like this, the, the size of problems I can run on my laptop, but absolutely like if I'm like, oh no, you know, I won't be in tune and be like, well, I can't do this because like it won't fit on my laptop, it won't run. I'll know I kind of have this in my toolbox uh, to do cloud computing. Yeah, nice. Um, uh, somebody asked about uh, like data quality. Like they're like, hey, you're training this, um, this model on images. You got the images from somewhere, then you put them up somewhere. Like, don't the the images need to be checked? Um, like, how would how would you do that in a real life situation? Like, how does that fit in this like cloud computing workflow? Um, or does it not matter? Like, um, mm -hmm. for this kind of modeling, um, like, how does that kind of fit in this um, this sort of world that we're talking about? Yeah, so it definitely didn't matter for my like little toy project, right? So sure, sure, like, wow. yeah, but yeah, for a real one, no. Um, in all seriousness, like, yes, of course, right? Like, like image quality matters. Um, you know, it's just kind of hard to do it at scale where right? a few millions, you can't like hand check every image. Uh, one of the most important things I would say is to uh, really think about, like I said, I just rescaled it to like 750 by a thousand, um, but I did it in such a way that it didn't preserve like aspect ratio, right? It just squished or elongated. Um, so that again, if I like kind of really care about making a good model, that could be a problem. Um, you know, one thing, uh, you might want to check, for example, is, okay, you know, is the height, you know, what's the, is the height always greater than width in my images or is it the other way around? Do I want to maybe rotate it? Is it going to be like, you know, rotation agnostic? Um, you know, do I want to, uh, you know, the problem is, you know, if I scale it up, everything up to where the biggest images is, like that's also distorted. There's different ways of scaling, like scaling algorithms. So I would actually say that's the biggest one. And that's something that's really you know, something that's specific to your project, but just really to be aware of that rather than just kind of like blithely being like, okay, everything got rescaled to this random number I picked. Uh, you really want to check, okay, what scale are my images at? And, you know, what makes sense to, to do given that? Yeah, 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 that's great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this, this is such a, you know, like this is something that so, so many teams right now are figuring out, dealing with, figuring out like how does what we do fit into these, um, these computational environments that are becoming like, like how things are done and necessary given like the kind of data we have. So I am so thankful, Emily, for your um, for your preparation and your willingness to share this with you based on you know the experience that you've had and whatnot. So um, thank you so much. Um, we're right up at time. So I will um, um, I will say thank you again. Um, I think uh, I will say that we'll, you can look for announcements about our next meeting on Meetup. And um, we will hope to see you next month. And then, like I said, we'll probably take uh, December off and then see you again in the new year. So keep uh, uh, you know keep your eyes out for the announcement. We'll hope to post this um, this recording of this month's uh, talk on our YouTube site, and you can look for old talks, older talks from previous sessions there if you would like that. And I will say um, thank you again to all of you for coming. Yeah, 